United States. I'll be chairing this and I have the pleasure to introduce Matt Kibbe from the United States as well. Of course, he is uh, known for the Free the People uh, Foundation, I suppose. And he'll be giving a talk on pandemic socialism, Hayek's critique of scientism and the fatal conceit of government lockdowns. Mr. Kibbe. <laughs> So I thought what I'd do, instead of simply telling you what I wrote in my paper, I thought I'd tell you a story about why I wrote this paper. And, and I'll start with the earliest days of the lockdowns in March of 2020. Um, I didn't think of Hayek when I saw the government response to COVID. I immediately started thinking about Frederick Bastiat. And it was because um, we were, at the time, we were going to take two weeks to flatten the curve. And in the United States, um, there was a, a very popular hashtag, pardon my French, but the hashtag was stay the fuck home. And I, I took that literally, and I was thinking to myself, what would happen if everybody stayed home for two weeks? And I th immediately thought about uh, one of my favorite essays in Frederick Bastiat in, in his book, Economic Sophisms, is a story he tells about how Paris is fed. Maybe some of you remember this. And the, the entire basis of the story is that everybody in Paris sleeps well at night, having no idea how or why it is that when they wake up in the morning, everything they need is at their fingertips food, shelter, energy, whatever it is, um, Parisians just take for granted the incredibly complex division of labor and these infinite things that happen so that Paris is fed the next morning. And, and, and I thought about that, obviously that, that book talks about the seen and the unseen, and I'm thinking about the best intentions of people who are telling us to shelter in place, and this is really before the government gets involved, and I'm like, um, I know they don't mean that because it would be a humanitarian disaster if they did. But of course, those lockdowns happened and, and at some point soon after, politicians started determining who was essential. In other words, which workers were going to be required to deliver your food to your door so that you could shelter in place and who was non-essential, non who had to stay home uh, whether they wanted to or not. And the, you know, the, the economic um, ignorance of that proposal was shocking to me. But then something really remarkable happened. In the United States, uh, how many people have heard of Anthony Fauci? See, that, that's remarkable to me. He is a mid-level bureaucrat in an alphabet agency in the United States. He's been in that position literally since he got out of school. And yet, he is also a pop star, right? He is a cultural influencer bar none. In the United States, you can actually buy St. Fauci religious candles and light them in his honor. And you could even build a little shrine in your home if you're feeling extra secure in doing so. Uh, the Guardian voted him sexiest man alive. What's that about? But he's also a consummate bureaucrat. He's an epidemiologist. He's been at NIAID um, his entire career. That's part of the National Institutes of Health. And he sits atop a massive pile of research dollars that are distributed not just in the United States, but across the world. So in a lot of ways, he drives almost all scientific research when it comes to not just epidemics, but a broad swath of things. And he also happens to be um, a top medical advisor to President Joe Biden. Think about how much power that gives him. Maybe it's not explicit political power, but it's an incredible amount of power. So when he says something is, it is. And there was this famous uh, argument between him and Senator Rand Paul, I think in July, 
and Rand was challenging him on some of NIH's investments in places like Wuhan. He was also um, pointing out that Fauci had said this, and then he flip-flopped and said that, and this and that, and he was creating a tremendous amount of uncertain, uncertainty in, in what the public should do. Should they wear a mask? Should they not wear a mask? Should they wear two masks? Well, Fauci said all of those things at different points in that. And, and Fauci got very agitated, and he got very indignant. And then he went on some TV show, and he, and he said in response to Senator Paul's criticism, frankly, any criticism of me is really an attack on science itself. Uh, and I'm thinking, uh, there's surely some meme out there where, where, where Fauci's like, I am the science. <laughs> and, and it reminded me, uh, not of Bastiat, but of, of a very different book, uh, Fred, Frederick Hayek's uh, Counter-Revolution of Science. And, and I had, um, on, a, on a very different project, I had revisited that book because I was trying empathetically to understand the rising interest in so-called democratic socialism. I was trying to, to, to understand what socialism means to people that haven't necessarily read all of the critiques of socialism that I have. And I went all the way back to the guy who supposedly coined the term, uh, Henri, uh, Henri de Saint-Simon. And, and he's, he's very much viewed as the founding father of socialism, a French aristocrat. Um, but in that book, The Counter-Revolution of Science, if you read it, it's, it's super un-Hayek because his disdain for Saint-Simon is, is breathtaking. He, he just thinks the guy is an idiot. And that's, that's not how Hayek writes. And it had always struck with me the first time I read it. It's like, why is he so pissed off at this guy? And then I reread it in the context of Fauci declaring, I am the science. And then I read saint Simon's works that were available in English. And I realized everything that we're seeing today as we cede all of this power, both explicit and implicit, to guys like Fauci and also guys like Neil Ferguson um, of the Imperial College. Do you guys, you guys know who this is? He's the guy that came up with the most draconian predictions of, of millions and millions and millions of people dying unless we lock down the country. And very persuasive in the UK, very persuasive in the United States. And, and he, of course, is not an epidemiologist. He's a physicist. And his models, amongst other things, uh, Phil Magnus at AIER has done a tremendous job uh, dissecting the, the flaws in, in, in the Imperial College model. But, but two things are interesting. He modeled a virus that, at the time, epidemiologists didn't know anything about it. So he had no data to plug into his model, so he had to um, make it up somehow. I'm sure it was educated guessing. Um, but more importantly, to our point, he also assumed that you guys, human beings, would not change your behavior at all in the face of a radically uncertain novel virus. Um, this, of course, is a classic example of what Hayek talks about in this book. It's scientism. It's, it's slavishly taking well, what you believe to be the methods of natural science and applying it to human behavior, thinking that somehow human action is exactly like atoms or protons or particles bouncing around. So these two things are happening, and I'm thinking about St. Simone. So I went back, perhaps foolishly, and I read some St. Simone. Now remember, this guy's important. He is the founding father of socialism. He's the founding father of positivism and in, in economics and philosophy. And he's also, it turns out, the father of the kinds of slavish, religious, almost, scientism that we're seeing play out today. And so this is from his first writing in 1803. And he's having a conversation with God. And as far as I can tell, he thinks he's actually having a conversation with God. Tell them that I have placed Newton by my side. This is God speaking. That I have entrusted him with the direction of the light and the commandment of all the inhabitants of all planets. The meeting of the 21 of those elected by humanity will be called the Council of Newton. The Council of Newton will represent me on Earth. This council 
will not accept those judgments, those it judges, this, the council will not accept those it judges inadequate to the most transcendent kinds of knowledge pertaining to the section for which they have been elected. In all the councils, the mathematician who obtains the most votes will preside. Each council will have a temple built which will contain a mausoleum in honor of Newton. This is Sir Isaac Newton. The temple will be divided into two parts. One which will contain the mausoleum will be decorated in the best ways the artist can devise. The other will be constructed and decorated in such a way as to give men an idea of the eternal destiny of those who would harm the progress of the sciences and the arts. Each of the faithful will find himself separated less than a day's walk from a temple and will descend once a year into the mausoleum of Newton via an, via an opening designa designated for this destination. Children will be brought there by their parents as soon as is possible after they are born. Here's the kicker. Everyone who fails to execute this commandment will be considered by the faithful as an enemy of the religion. So what he's saying, this, this, this plays out throughout um, all of St. Simone's work, is he always imagined a world where the really smart guys, the engineers, the mathematicians, and he always adds the artists on at the end, I guess, to give it a little bit of flair, but it's the, it's the, it's the technocrats that he wants to give complete and total control to redesign the economy from the top down. And if the last 18 months don't sort of invoke that in your mind, you're missing something because this, this unprecedented experiment over the last 18 months, whether intentional or not, has, has really transferred all of the power to these guys, these unelected officials, um, the Neil Ferguson's and the, and all the epidemiologists, I'm sure in all of your countries, you, you probably have a guy like that or guys who have attached themselves to the political class and are dictating for better or worse, what we do in response to this pandemic. In our country, um, uh, follow the science became first a recommendation and then a commandment and then an almost religious invocation, right? Um, if you don't follow the science, and the science is defined by experts like Fauci, um, you're, you're not just a bad person, you're committing a sin. And to me, that's, that's super weird, but it's also super dangerous, which gets back to, to Hayek's point in the counter-revolution of science. Um, he was in this project in the midst of an ongoing debate that he was having with central planners and socialists, Keynes, of course, before that. But he was trying to explain to, to really smart people how they couldn't possibly know enough to centrally reorganize society because it was infinitely complex and the knowledge itself was not something that was sort of objectively available to anybody. It was, it was discovered through a process called the market. And, and maybe, maybe it was a tangent, but his, his critique of scientism um, looks like an even more uh, prescient prediction of, of where we are today, because we have, we have gone from, from sort of central planning based on, on equity, based on, on all of the normal um, class struggle arguments that socialists have made, but now it's about something else. It's about keeping us safe. And if you think I'm exaggerating, I want to read you a quote from Anthony Fauci. And it's fascinating to me. This, this guy has written all sorts of things, like he's been a career bureaucrat forever, but he writes in all the academic journals, the virology journals, the biology journals. Um, it turns out, by the way, tangentially, he's a huge enthusiast of, of gain of function research, um, despite uh, Regardless of what you think happened in Wuhan, he, he actually argued in 2019 that any risk associated with, with, social, with, with uh, genetically engineering viruses is surely worth it in a cost-benefit thing. And I'm like, I don't know if he still thinks that, but, but he certainly argued that in 2019. But here's an article that Fauci wrote 
in late 2020, if you're wondering where we're going. And again, tell me if this doesn't sound familiar. Living in greater harmony with nature will require changes in human behavior, as well as other radical changes that may take decades to achieve. Rebuilding the infrastructures of human existence. Rebuilding the infrastructures of human existence. From cities to homes to workplaces to water and sewer systems to recreational and gathering venues. In such a transformation, we will need to prioritize changes in those human behaviors that constitute risks for the emergence of infectious diseases. Chief among them are reducing crowding at home, work, in public places, as well as minimizing environmental perturbations, that's a funny word, such as deforestation, intense urbanization, and intensive animal farming. It is a useful thought experiment to note that in, until recent decades and centuries, many deadly pandemic diseases either did not exist or not, were not significant problems. The beautiful days. Cholera, for example, was not known in the West until the late 1700s and became pandemic only because of human crowding and international travel, which allowed new access of the bacteria in regional Asian ecosystems to the unsanitary water and sewer systems that characterize cities throughout the Western world. This realization leads us to suspect that some and probably very many of the living improvements achieved over the recent centuries come at a high cost that we will pay in deadly disease emergencies. Since we cannot return to ancient times, can we at least use lessons from those times to bend modernity in a safer direction? These are questions to be answered by all societies and their leaders, philosophers, builders, and thinkers, and those involved in appreciating and influencing the environmental detriments to human health. So when I read that, and I didn't know about that essay when I started writing this paper, I started with this assumption that there was something eerily familiar about these weird old things that, that Henry St. Simone used to write and what we're doing today I was surprised at how candid Fauci was that he is not a scientist in this sense. He is a social engineer, very much in the sense that Hayek was criticizing. He has grand pretensions, you might even say a fatal conceit in his mind, as to how he could reorganize society. And if you question him, you're attacking science itself. Thank you very much. So we have about three minutes for any Q and A. Does anybody have a question? Huh? Yes. Good night, Mike. Thank you. Um, it's 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 your your you know your your reference back to Hayek. I think is um, is very timely because Hayek won the debate with the socialists and the central planners. But one of the reasons the re reason he won it was because he said you can't predict the outcome of what you're doing. But what he did say to people was, which is a huge influence on the current debate, was, was that if you put in place rules, and then the rules are fair to everybody and apply equally to everybody, then the outcome of those is fine. And so what we have is monetary rules, not a fixed monetary outcome. And I think the problem was, was that Bruno Leone and Murray Rothbard immediately honed in on that and said, there are two different types of rules. There's coercive rules, and there's rules that we voluntarily adhere to. And they said that was going to make a massive difference. And I think that if, that was, if Hayek was an error there, then he's, he's got a degree of responsibility for what's happening to us now. You know, he could be right in most of the things that he wrote, which I think we all think. But if he was wrong on that point, and Bruno Leone and Murray Rothbard were very vociferous about that at the time, then, then he does bear a responsibility for all of this. It's not all St. Simone anymore. It's partly Hayek. Interesting. I think that might be right, although I think, um, I mean, I don't know, this, I feel like we need to have 10 beers and argue about this. Um, because, you know, when I, when I hear Hayek talk about rules, I think about the, the rules that have emerged spontaneously to hold us all together. And, and in this particular case, what's interesting about lockdowns is that there, the scientific community did, in fact, have a consensus that locking down civil society would be a catastrophic disaster. 
and in, in my paper, and, and I think everybody here understands some of those stories, it's not just the economic unintended consequences of this, but the health consequences are, are, are pretty catastrophic because COVID is not the number one killer in the world. Uh, heart disease is. And heart disease, and, and I've, I've cited some data, but we will see uh, more compelling data as this emerges, is how many people died because of guys like Andrew Cuomo. And this happened, um, I'm sure it happened all over the world, but in the United States, politicians decided to micromanage the, the patient flow in hospitals as if they know anything about this. And most tragically, when, when Cuomo herded uh, recovering senior citizens into seniors' homes and, and killed a lot of people. But um, the unseen consequence of that, of course, is people that didn't get treatment for heart disease, people that didn't get treatment for cancer, um, mental illness, depression, like the, the list is too, too sad to even recite here. And so um, there, there were rules to be followed, and they didn't follow their own rules. Like there was a, a broad scientific understanding that the, all the things they're doing now would be a really bad idea. And it flipped like a switch because just a few people, and I mentioned two of them, they decided for us that they were going to experiment. Let's see what happens if we lock down the world. Um, so I don't, I don't know if that's Ike's fault. I don't, I don't think so. Fortunately, we're really out of time for the more Q&A. Matt Kibbe, everybody. Thank you.